ะลองทานขำนิดนึงเ
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Victor from the STAR events team, and I'm glad to be your host for tonight's session. Thank you for joining tonight's live on web online seminar on what new business opportunities can RCEP bring to your company and Malaysia. This one hour session is organized by STAR Media Group Berhad and is streamed live on STAR Biz Facebook page. So thank you everyone who's tuning in right now. Do share our Starbiz Facebook Live with any of your colleagues or friends who are keen to join. All right, a uh, few quick housekeeping matters before we begin. As everyone dials in to this webinar through different internet bandwidth and devices, you may or may not experience minor technical glitches, so please be patient if there's any. To minimize the risk of technical glitch, all participants are muted, video cam turned off, and chat box disabled by default but do participate by posting questions to our panel. You may send in your questions to our panelists at any time during the session. On your user panel, click on the Q&A button and post your questions if you're using Zoom or place it in the comment section if you're watching via FB Live. There will be a short survey at the end. So to those joining us on Zoom, please take a few minutes to complete it. Your opinion matters to us. Lastly, and most importantly, please engage, learn, and enjoy. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, is set to ignite economic growth and spur recovery from COVID-19. This agreement will impact the Malaysian economy, and tonight's panelists will discuss on how SMEs and MNCs can adapt to benefit from this trade agreement. The panel of experts lined up for this discussion is made up of a representative from the government, an economist, and an academic. They, are, they will be sharing their views from the various perspectives on RCEP. For tonight's discussion, we have the pleasure of having Mr. Kung Bin Lung as our moderator. Mr. Kung is a National Council Member, Chairman of SME's Committee from the Associated Chinese Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Malaysia. He is also a managing partner of RADA LLKG International and CEO of K Consult Perturbation Syndrome Berhad. He is also actively involved in various common, common, commerce and community services. With that, I'd like to hand over to Mr. Kong to begin this session. Over yeah, to you, thank Mr. you. Kong. Thank you, our host. Uh, good evening to everyone and a warm welcome uh, for tuning in today our webinar. What new business opportunity can ASEP bring to Malaysia and your company in particular? I'm LL Kung over here. I'm glad to be your moderator uh, this evening on today's topic. To begin with the discussions, it's my pleasure to introduce our three panelists, Tadusri Norasman Ayob, Mr. Lee Inkui, and Mr. Wani Lim. Tadusri Norasman Ayub is currently the Deputy Secretary in respect of Industrial Development of MITI. Throughout his career, he has been involved in the formulation of policy, planning and implementation of projects, creation of business development opportunities, among many others. Mr. Lee is an Executive Director of Social Economic Research Center of ACCIM. He has 30 years of professional uh, experience as an econ economist with almost 12 years in Bank Nagara, Malaysia and 18 years in financial services. The third speaker, Mr. Guani Lim, is an independent project consultant in various international organizations and incoming assistant professor at National Graduate Institute of Policy Study in Japan. I'm sure we will have a very interesting discussions tonight, especially with our three wonderful panelists. So let us begin uh, right away. Uh, first of all, uh, before I call upon uh, our panelists to discuss on today's topic, uh, let me briefly talk about the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, signed on the November 15, 2020 at a virtual ASEAN summit hosted by Vietnam. Uh, the RCEP, uh, negotiations were kick-started uh, during the 21st ASEAN Summit in Cambodia back in 2012. After eight years, it finally signed uh, this year, 2020. ASEP aim, aims to create an integrated market uh, with 15 countries, making it easier, easier for the product and services of each of these countries 
to be available across the region, especially the focus on the following trade in goods and services, investment, intellectual property, dispute settlement, e-commerce, SME, and economic corporations. Overall, ASEP represents a significant achievement. In fact, the 15 countries are the 10 ASEAN uh, members plus the five. Who are the five? Australia, China, Japan, New Zealand, and South Korea. Uh, however, look at this, uh, this country. These 15 countries are very diverse in nearly uh, every imaginable, imaginable dimensions. Getting an agreement of this type that could successfully navigate and domestic constraint and a starting point in all these 15 countries is an important achievement and accomplishment. However, what does this mean in practice, especially in your business? With this parcel in our mind, I would like to invite Tattoo 3, first of all, to give us a first impression when you look at this asset. We know that you are the formulations of policy. Please, Tattoo 3. Thank you, Mr. Kung and fellow panelists. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having myself as well as the Ministry of National Trade Industry um, for this session here um, to talk about, uh, about RCEP, about RCEP, and what are those opportunities that perhaps RCEP can bring to uh, our economy as well as to our businesses here in Malaysia. Well, um, if you ask me my impression or uh, what I think about the RCEP, first and foremost, uh, having negotiated this uh, FTA, uh, for the last two years, uh, out of the nearly eight years of negotiations, uh, seeing that it has come to a successful conclusion and being signed by our Honourable Prime Minister together with 14 other heads of government or leaders uh, on the 15th of November recently, to me, it's a huge relief, uh, not only because of the fact that it has taken us quite a while, nearly eight years to negotiate this particular free trade agreement, but because of the, I would say, the economic impact, first and foremost, uh, you're talking about perhaps the largest F ever FTA that Malaysia has signed, and perhaps even for the world um, at present, where you have 15 countries, which account for nearly 30% of the world's GDP and one third of the world's population. Um, and if India were to come on board uh, in the future, then of course, these numbers would actually increase. Uh, apart from that, um, I think what's unique about the RCEP is that it is an FTA which is predominantly ASEAN driven. Now, why I say so, because throughout the course of negotiations, uh, how these negotiations unfold is that the ASEAN member states, all of us will have a caucus and we'll come up, we'll come to a common position. Um, then only then do we actually meet up with the other five or six when India was still present in the negotiations with the six uh, ASEAN FTA partners to present our positions. Now, apart from that, uh, of course, in this particular FTA, you can see that there are basically countries from diverse economic stages. So you have the least developed countries um, like Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar. And then you have the developing economies like Malaysia um, Brunei and the rest. And of course, we have the far more developed economies, for example, Japan and Korea. So it's not easy to have an FTA where you see different countries with different economic levels of development coming together to sign this particular FTA. And of course, um, lastly, uh, I would say that throughout these um, negotiations uh, for RCEP, we try to balance the objective of promoting international trade as well as ensuring sustainable domestic industrial development. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sri. Uh, with your, this kind of intro introductions about asset, uh, you talk about the uh, need to be balanced and sustainability. With this, uh, we would like to invite uh, Mr. Lee as an economist uh, to, to talk a little bit about asset uh, from your perspective. Mr. Lee, please. Thank you, Mr. Kong. Uh, let me pull out the screen. I'd like to share screen. So you have something to share with us. Yeah. Can you see the thing? Can you see? Yeah, to see. Okay. Uh, yeah, before see. I go uh, through is there any the screen. Can you see? Hello? Can't see. Can't see. Huh? 
can't see. They can't see? Let me try again, huh? Okay. Yeah, can see. Can, huh? Oh, yeah. Let me... Okay. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the uh, technical. Yeah, uh, before I go through the three slides, I'd like to uh, give my impression about this asset. I think it's, it's better late than never, yeah? First of all, uh, hopefully things will flow better going forward in order to make us set a very powerful, uh, largest single uh, free trade agreement that is fully committed towards international trade connectivity, uh, as well as based on the rule-based multilateral uh, trading arrangement and in order to enhance the free flows of the trade and investment. But I hope that uh, once the RCEP is in place, after the uh, ratification from the member country. And I hope it can be further upgraded, uh, can be further adjusted and improved further to make it more uh, uh, effective, uh, what called the free trade agreement to support uh, uh, better flows of trade and investment. So basically, I just want to share uh, one, some of the basic, you know, what we know about ASEP, which uh, our panelists, Dr. Sri Noasman and uh, Mr. Kong has uh, quickly run, uh, briefly run through. Uh, this is a big, uh, sing world largest single free trade agreement. Uh, global GDP accounted about close to 28.2 percent, 24 trillion. Global trade is about 10.4 trillion, 27.2 percent of global trade, and global population is about 2.3 billion, close to 30 percent of world population. So we look at the whole ASEAN, the 10 ASEAN country and five ASEAN FTA partner. The scope, obviously, obviously, is about trade reduction, tariff reduction, try to facilitate trade, uh, uh, encourage more investment liberalization, uh, protection of intellectual property rights, facilitation and e-commerce, uh, and also allow further economic and technical cooperation. But to simplify in three simple, uh, I think it's about strengthening regional value chain, user-friendly and easy to use, and it's a modern, comprehensive, and high quality. But if I were to do a comparison between RCEP and CPTPP, uh, obviously RCEP is not that ambitious in terms of scope and also in terms of depth compared to CPTPP. Uh, basically, you look at the, there are only 20 chapters in RCEP compared to T CPTPP is about 30 chapters. And there are three areas which are not covered by the uh, RCEP. One is the government subsidy, Second is the invest, uh, what called environmental protection, and also the, the use of the labor union, which I think later we can discuss further uh, coming from the government perspective. So to me, what matters to manufacturers and business coming from RCEP? Uh, other than the normal tariff line reduction, at least 90%, 92% of the tariff line over the span of 20 years, but I think more important, we need to get into attention of the trade deals. I think there are some some of the tariff reduction may be not that significant for some sector as compared to for the agriculture sector. I think what most important behind all this tariff line is the non-tariff uh, uh, facilitation, which I talk about red tech, behind the border barriers, data flows and protection. These are the real issue when you talk to any businessman who are, uh, want to benefit the most from all this uh, free trade deal. And that's why it's important for the government uh, to continue to facilitate the trade uh, in terms of a custom custom procedure. Uh, we need something like predictable, consistent, transparent, that will help to lower the trade transaction cost, enhance even more uh, standard efficiency. So there are a lot of costs associated with inefficient trade facilitation. So I think most of the time when the free trade sign, agreement sign, that's only about tariff line. But the non-tariff barrier, that's the one more challenging for any businesses when you want to do cross-border trade and, and investment. So it's about procedure delays, lack of predictability in the nature, application, and interpretation of the uh, guidelines, formality, and contract. And they could be also lead to lost business opportunity because of the delay in one country 
may have negative effect along the whole supply chain and a supply of the trade related services may also be affected yeah see the reduction in the business so it's important uh, as i continue to exp express my concern is that we can always say about trade line reduction but the non-tariffs the one is, is more challenging and the last slide uh, which I want to share also, what can government do further to facilitate the business, uh, which is also related to the previous slide, continue facilitation and the government job is not just stop at the end of the conclusion of the negotiation. There's more to come, uh, whether it's, it's signed or ratified. So the after, after is the most important hurdle for us to cross. So I think it's good for all the asset members to set the mechanism to address all the non-tariff barriers within ASEP. And, and, and in this area, uh, I'd like to propose a few things, uh, how to enhance further the trade facilitation. One is to improve the quality of trade rules across the region, protect the data flows, and reduce behind the borders barriers. Second, we must ensure the exporters and investors understand their rights under international agreement and provide a very good contact point for companies facing non-tariff barriers. So this is something that we hope MITI can, can help uh, to further facilitate areas related to non-tariff barriers. And lastly, to improve the market network and website to include information on new forms of export, new risk, and international digital compliance advice. I will stop here, uh, Mr. Kong. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> very comprehensive because I asked you to have uh, two minutes of uh, overview. <laughs> very comprehensive. You want even ask MITI what to do. <laughs> uh, but uh, before we go to the first discussion point, uh, I would like to, uh, and, uh, the third uh, panelist, uh, Kwan Yi Lim, uh, just have an overview. Uh, what do you think when you when you look at this ASEP sign on the 15th of November? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kong. Uh, thank you to my fellow panelists as well. I believe the two presentations were very comprehensive. I don't have much to add, only a few points is that, uh, look, 2020 is a horrible year for all of us. And this is actually a very good end to 2020. It is a very good end. And this has been there for this thing, RCEP, has been initiated since at least 2012, as far as I can remember. And unfortunately, India, our friends, uh, they drop out. But otherwise, this is good and, you know, uh, the worrying thing is that international trade has been reducing over the last few years. So, you know, for the sake of us, for the sake of ASEAN or Asia, we need this. So this is, a, to me, of course, there still will be a ratification process, that one we can discuss later. But, you know, we, we take any victory la, at this stage. So this is a cheerful end to 2020. Yep. Okay. Uh, just now you talk about ratification process. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Datu Sri back to Datu Sri. Actually, uh, we know the uh, asset now is not enforced. Yet. You, you, you must have a ratification of certain countries. You know? um, first of all, I would like to ask, and then uh, what is the overall impact on the Malaysian economy once asset is fully enforced? You know? I know Mr. Lee has brought up some. You know? Wow. Datu Sri, please come. Thank you. Um, as, as far as this uh, impact of the RCP is concerned, um, of course, we have done some preliminary assessment here. So from the GDP point of view, um, the estimation is, of course, we will see an increase of a nominal GDP by about 1% um, for the next 10 years. And as far as trade is concerned, as far as our external trade is concerned, um, we are estimating an increase by about 20 billion uh, in the next 10 years, yeah, once the RCP or RCEP comes into force. Um, but apart from that, I think we do not only need to measure, or we must not only measure the impact of the RCEP in terms of the numbers, but most importantly is in terms of the opportunities that is going to be offered to our businesses. Uh, for example, I think being one of the largest, or perhaps the largest FTA that I've just mentioned, um, our businesses can actually avail themselves of the opportunity to integrate into the regional and perhaps even the global supply chain. Um, one of the things that we talked about just now, I think this was also uh, alluded by Mr. Lee, is in terms of the non-tariff barriers. 
Um, so when we talk about integration into the regional or global supply chain, there are two parts to it. One, of course, in terms of tariff reduction. Yeah, this is where you see a lowering of the import duty when you export your product to a country. Now, apart from that, um, how can businesses actually avail themselves of the opportunity to integrate is by using what we call the principle of accumulation. That means, for example, if in the past, say, if I take an example of an FTA that ASEAN has with Japan. So if your product were to be exported, say, from Malaysia, right, which is considered as part of ASEAN into Japan, you can only qualify for the preferential duty if your particular product meet the particular rules of origin, right? Uh, this is, uh, to put it in very simply, in layman words, it means if your product constitutes a certain percentage of what we consider as local content, original, local, original value content, then your product will qualify for preferential duty. Now, imagine this. If I'm just talking about ASEAN and Japan, that means you're only talking about 10 countries, 10 ASEAN member states plus Japan. But with RCEP now, we have 15 RCEP countries or RCEP participating countries. So therefore, with this uh, greater number of countries, the opportunities are greater for a particular company to source their raw materials, their parts and components, as well as the fact that by having a greater diverse supply of um, uh, uh, sources where they can source their materials, whatnot, it can also help them to penetrate a wider market as well. Now, apart from that, uh, I heard as well just now from Mr. Lee that in terms of non-tariff barriers, you're right in the sense that uh, most often, I think people do not pay much attention to that part, which is to me the most important one, because here you're talking about the industrial standards, technical regulations, conformity assessment procedures. And these are often, these are often sometimes being, um, of course, been mentioned as non-tariff barriers. Huh? And in RCEP, what we trend to, what, we, we have, what our intention was, is to have all the 15 countries, the RCEP placement countries, to try to adopt as much as possible the, the particular international standards when it comes to industrial standards, as well when it comes to technical regulations, and to the best endeavor for each country to accept the test results of the conformity assessment procedures conducted by another country. Therefore, what it means is you do not have, you do not need to have your product being retested again once it has been certified. I think this will help to reduce the cost of doing business. And of course, the other part of it is in terms of promoting greater transparency in terms of each country's policies, laws, and regulations, as well as in terms of information sharing. Thank you. Yeah, that was three. You mentioned about all these things. I, I, I feel that later, I think a lot of participants would like to know what sector, you know? just now you mentioned quite broadly in the respect of uh, uh, no need to be retested, all those things. It's, it's very good. That means your uh, certificate of origin from one country can be used of the rest of the country. You know? And then this is fantastic. You know? why, why not I ask uh, Mr. Lee in respect of this uh, issue first? Um, mm -hmm. the Malaysia economy. Uh, how is it benefit Malaysia economy or it, it affected Malaysia economy in general of this okay, asset? Uh, okay, thank you, Mr. Kong. I think basically the whole asset will have uh, economic and distribution effect on any country, including Malaysia, uh, in terms of your output, income and export, or even uh, in terms of the impact on the worker welfare. So basically, if you look at the Malaysia total trade with the asset country, it's about 58% of which export is about 56.3% export share, whereas import close to 60%. So you combine the import export total trade is about uh, close to 58%. And, and that will tell you that, that this big market there for the Malaysian business, especially SME, to have uh, to tap on. And people will say, why? Why should uh, any different compare asset? Anyway, the ASEAN country have their respective free trade agreement with the, three, uh, the five countries. So, but that's what Dato Sri alluded to, because you have a standardizing of the, what called the AOA, the rule of origin, that will help instead of you going to negotiate with every single one through your free trade agreement, one part. Second thing, you can allow the member country uh, to calculate, uh, get into your calculation of the ROO. That also helps to uh, lower the uh, transaction cost and the time taken for you to cross-border your trade and, and the services. So to summarize the broad impact from all this asset on Malaysia, I would say the first thing, 
uh, which I supported, fully supported Data Suite, is that it will allow Malaysian company and foreign company uh, to have more strategic uh, partnership, uh, that investment partnership, that will help us also because you have Korea and, and Japan, we are very strong in the level of technology that could have some impact on the transfer of knowledge and technology. And second thing, you will also position Malaysia as a hub for economic activity and, and as part of the global or regional supply chain. Why? Because when you streamline ASEAN plus one FTA into one single uh, agreement, that helps to assess at least 50% of the market. So with the connectivity, if everything works right, yeah, if everything works right and smoothly, which means that you also spill over to other activity like tourism, uh, like the travel industry, uh, even your aviation industry. And the third one is for Malaysian. So Malaysian as a consumer, we can get access to more wider choice of goods, which is even maybe cheaper, better quality, or even price competitively. At the same time, as a manufacturer or supplier, you also can access the source of raw material. So that helps to uh, increase more competition. As, as you say, I mean, competition is good. Good. Uh, there's a pressure coming from outside, then you make your, your domestic company, your SME, to be more competitive. Of course, some sector will be affected, which we will, we will discuss later. And third, the last point, which I, last two points, the, the, the second last point is that talking about asset. ASEAN is complement ASEAN as the investment or production hub. So Malaysia also stand to benefit if we can get our policy right. We make sure our investment climate is good. We make sure our regulatory environment is very conducive. I think investment will flow to, to, to this part of our Malaysia will feel the effect. And, and also the ASEAN also talking about digitalization e-commerce. So this is the part where SME, you have to uh, uh, think how do you want to uh, use more digital technology or e-commerce platform to have a wider reach of the market. So in summary, based on the World Bank study, based on the United Nations uh, ASCAP and also a private research study, uh, showed that the RCEP will have impact on Malaysia GDP by at least 0.8 to about 1 to 1.8 percentage point. Yeah? And in terms of export, it could be increased by at least 24%. So as I would I would agree with Data Three is that we numbers we, we should not be too much uh, uh, brought down with numbers. Anyway, these are based on scenario, based on uh, assumption. But most important, how do we take advantage of this, and, and how how government can help the uh, businesses, in particular SME, to face the reality that after eight years, you know, so it's time for you to think uh, uh, how to how to make fullest of this uh, asset. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you touched about a very interesting point about this SMB. We would like to discuss at a later part of SMB, you know. Uh, just now, you and Dato Sri mentions about the numbers. They say GDP increased by 1% for the next 10 years, and then the 20B about the trade volume, all those things, you know, if the policy is right. So talk about policy later. We will come back to this difficult question to Dato Sri, you know. Uh, <laughs> Okay, Kwani, uh, as a, let's say from academic point of view, uh, what do you think about asset? Uh, you benefit Malaysia economy to what extent? Thank you, Mr. Kung again. Firstly, um, in, in all agreements, uh, some will lose, some will win, right? I mean, we, we have to acknowledge that for us, we, we want to win more, basically. <laughs> all, all countries who want to win more, we, we don't actually say that, but that's the nature of FTAs and MTAs. So my understanding, I mean, if we were look, to look at sector by sector, I think that would be a lot easier. So I think the, the immediate winners for us would be commodities-based players. So you have the palm oil players and palm oil-related products rubber and rubber related products and wood and wood related product which includes furniture and all of this uh, the immediate winners because we are already quite strong i think malaysia if you say number we are number two no one would dare to say that number one in all three industries combined we are very competitive um, and the next winners that we can forecast and we can predict is our finance players, our telco players, and other finance-related services. 
this is where you see our GLCs, you know, these are, these are low hanging fruits. Although services component, they tend to come a bit later for FTAs, but I think, you know, the main banks, the CMBs will, will win quite big on this. We'll win quite big on this. And, you know, electronics, I'm, I'm a bit worried because we export and import a lot of electronics, right? If you look at Penang, but the thing is, this is a lot of it is driven by TNCs. And, you know, that's, that's a part that, that is our, I would say is a part where Malaysians, we are, you know, we've, we've never really caught up to the level of Korea or Taiwan, but we're not as bad as other countries. So that's a part where it's a bit tricky. The top line will be good, right? We'll still have a lot of export, a lot of imports. But, um, you know, that's, that's my worry. So to summarize, the commodities players, you know, whether you're GLC or private sector, you're likely going to win big. The finance, the telco, the GLCs, we're likely to win big again. Electronics and newer generation products, that one will probably win some and lose some because we never really had that tech advantage there. So those are my three points. Okay, thanks a lot. You, you, you touched about the uh, sector, you know? You see, which sector, I would like to ask, ask uh, as a private sector, uh, Mr. Lee over here, you know. You see, we ask that, we know economics is very good, just how that those three and uh, Hinkui also mentions uh, our, our Malaysia will become much better. But a lot of businessmen say, let's say I'm in the automotive, I'm in this sector, or I gain or I lose. So I would like to ask Mr. Lee about this question. Okay, I think uh, if you look at the schedule of commitment, which I think Dr. Sri can, can further elaborate for me, I glance through the, the chapter of all this uh, commitment that we offer ourselves uh, to, to other asset countries. Uh, I narrow down particular to the automotive sector. So that is a highly sensitive sector because of the national automotive policy and also because of my uh, self-interest. I want to buy a cheaper uh, motor car. Yeah? So, of course, I will support national car as well. But I look at the, the, the level of tariff for auto, uh, automotive sector. I think it's only about after the fourth year or fifth year, they will start to reduce. Yeah? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, Dr. Sri. So that shows that uh, there are some uh, levels of uh, uh, what I call the protection according to some of the sector, which I think Malaysia feel that uh, we are still not at the level where we can uh, fully compete with all these uh, players, more so with, uh, from, I mean, talk about uh, auto hub in, in Thailand. But to, to add on to what uh, uh, our uh, Rene uh, Lim talking about sectors, uh, some sector which I agree with what he said, uh, but I think look at the furniture and the wood and wood-based product, I think we have to be also be aware uh, of the competition coming from China and also from Vietnam. There's something that uh, we, 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 we should not uh, totally uh, 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 complacent that definitely we, we have the edge. Yes, I agree with you, but I think uh, these are the quite competitive uh, cost uh, country which may be uh, uh, direct competition with us. And the other sector would be the textile and wearing apparel, which is known, which known that uh, likely to be uh, affected. Uh, competition coming from Vietnam as well and some of the low-cost uh, competitors in ASEAN country. Uh, on the E and E sector, uh, at this moment, I think it's hard to make a call whether we'll be losing out because uh, E and E within the ASEAN uh, is most uh, deeply integrated along the supply chain. So if you based on what the ASEAN rules, talking about the uh, ROO and also the you can uh, accumulate under the rules of the ROO calculation, I think we still have uh, uh, an edge to uh, further add value to this E and E. I think the my condi the condition is that we have to further add value. Yeah, we have to further uh, uh, have a up up uh, upskill cycle uh, value chain. That then we can have a, a better edge in this uh, particular area. The other sector which I also agree: food and beverages, chemical products, rubber product, plastic product, machinery and equipment. Uh, these are the sectors likely to uh, benefit uh, from the asset. Uh, in terms of services, if you look at services as a whole, uh, the level of the opening are quite moderate.
but definitely if for those who are in the uh, telco, in the finance, banking, and also consultancy, uh, that opened up a lot of enhanced cooperation uh, between Malaysia service provider with the uh, rest of the asset members. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Lee. In respect of the sector, I, I would like to ask um, that to three. You see, uh, some sector, that's how Hing Tui men mentioned a lot of sectors, you know. Would you like to mention some sector that's a big gain, you know, and then some sector that is a really very challenging, you know. So <laughs> I would like to know, in specific, you know, uh, we don't talk about so many sectors from agricultural to manufacturing to A and E to services. We don't talk about. Let's see, concentrate which sector we want. We want to know that, you know, because I'm afraid I'm in certain sector may may lose out, you know. <laughs> okay, thank you, Kong. Okay, so I think it's better for me to perhaps um, highlight one of those sectors which, um, as far as the RC is concerned, when we negotiate in terms of tariff reduction, uh, it's either we actually put it into another basket uh, where we exclude it altogether from tariff I mentioned, or we put it in another basket where we consider it as highly sensitive or sensitive, therefore, in terms of the tariff reduction, it takes a longer period of time. And of course, there is another basket where mm. the tariffs are immediately eliminated upon entry into force of RCEP. Now, just very generally, some of the sectors that, of course, as far as Malaysia is concerned, which we consider as sensitive, would consist of, well, number one, of course, just as Mr. Lee has highlighted, the automotive sector. Then you also have the iron and steel sector, uh, chemical um, sector, the plastics sector, uh, even rubber for that matter, uh, certain machineries and equipment. So these are some of the sectors, um, oh sorry, and one more is of course petrochemical as well. Now these are some of those sectors which we consider as sensitive, therefore in terms of this, uh, the staging of the tariff elimination, uh, it takes a longer period of time. Okay. Um... I think I, I would like Tattoo Sri to continue. We mentioned a lot of sector. I, I want to do something uh, about SME. You know? mm. Malaysia SME, we know Malaysia SME is so important, 98.5% uh, establishment of SME. Is SME stand to gain or stand to lose? What are the opportunities perhaps uh, for this, mm. this SME? If mm. you don't take up this opportunity, I think there is a mm. threat for the SME. Uh, Tattoo Sri, can you elaborate about this one? Yeah, thank you. Um, of course, uh, I've mentioned earlier, um, there are several benefits. So if you look at in terms of the tariff elimination, so one, of course, in terms of having a greater market access to 16 countries, yeah? so we're talking about nearly 2.2 billion people here. Now, apart from that, um, SMEs will also benefit from the opportunity of having able to integrate into the regional and global supply chain. Now, in fact, um, there is a specific chapter in the RCPE agreement that is dedicated wholly to the SMEs. Okay. Uh, in that chapter, if you were to read that trigger chapter, it seems that it's very simple in a sense, um, but it actually addresses one of the key features in terms of assisting SMEs, which is to facilitate number one, information sharing, and number two, in terms of providing technical and capacity building cooperation programs for the SMEs. Because um, all the RCEP participating countries, especially the ASEAN member states, we acknowledge that SMEs play a very important role as far as our economy is concerned. Now, in case of Malaysia, as we all know, the SMEs contributed nearly 57.7% to our GDP. So therefore, SMEs will always play a very important role. Now, uh, apart from that, of course, all the other chapters in the RCEP text or the RCEP agreement will also be able to assist the SMEs. Now, here, for example, um, of course, against the current backdrop where we have the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we are now having seen new normal in terms of how we conduct businesses. And of course, we all know that as far as e-commerce transactions are concerned, uh, we can see there's an increase in terms of number of transactions due to the restrictions in terms of mobility. And in fact, in terms of the RCEP, we have a dedicated chapter on e-commerce and it basically addresses several elements. Number one it is to foster trust by consumers in e-commerce <clears throat> within this region. And number two is, of course, building capacity, uh, particularly for SMEs to participate in the e-commerce trade. And thirdly, is in terms of ensuring there is sufficient or adequate data protection 
as well as safety or security um, as far as transactions conducted online. So all this actually, um, if our SMEs were to uh, take the opportunity to, of course, firstly, they have to read the agreement, they have to understand it, and uh, they also have to uh, learn how to be able to avail themselves of these opportunities. And of course, as far as the Ministry of International Trade is concerned, we will be conducting a series of outreach sessions very much soon uh, in order to help to create greater awareness of RCEP and also to build greater understanding of RCEP, especially for the SMEs. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Datuk Sri. Uh, just now you mentioned about SME in respect of e-commerce. Can you elaborate a little bit uh, how this asset uh, can help the SME in terms of e-commerce, especially in this uh, COVID era? You know? <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I think what was most important in, in any in e-commerce, especially at the ASEAN level, in fact, there is an ASEAN agreement on e-commerce. It addresses several elements here. Yeah? Uh, one is, of course, in the infrastructure. So, of course, when you have a specific chapter on e-commerce in any FTA, it serves as a motivation for countries that are parties to the FTA to develop the necessary infrastructure to enable uh, e-commerce to be carried out. That's number one. Number two, it will also guide the policy development of each of these countries within the RCEP region in terms of promoting e-commerce. So that will also serve as a guide because now we have an FTA of which you should or you can actually refer to in terms of developing your policies because whatever national policies that you have, uh, ideally or by right, it should be consistent with your international commitments. Yeah? And of course, uh, thirdly, um, it will also help to enhance basically uh, investors' confidence in a particular country whereby if, for example, in the case of Malaysia being a party to RCEP, where there is a specific uh, chapter or there are provisions related to e-commerce of which Malaysia are committed to. Uh, this, will, of course, will also um, help to drive investments into Malaysia and also to the RCEP region as a whole. And by that, therefore, um, the SMEs will be able to participate in those business opportunities. Okay, thank you. Uh, 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 Mr. Lee, would you like to add something in respect of SMB? Because I feel the SME out there I think they want to know more in respect of this. I think the, the, if you ask me, the, uh, the reaction from the SME out there is about concern about the level playing field. When you uh, open up your market and uh, it may put them in a less competitive position for those who are not that competitive, they will be worried about, you know, the local market share will be eaten away already before the asset. We talk about when China uh, investment flow into the country uh, and, and, and there's concern about all this supply of cheaper goods coming from China that flood the market and edge out our local SME. Yeah? So I think, uh, I, I would think uh, Dato Sri point is very valid. I think we, we have to look beyond that. Uh, of course, there's no uh, fair for everyone. I mean, there's no win-win. Uh, someone will, will be feeling more more compact, uh, more uh, competition. Well, some 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 sector will be more competitive and push them to be more even uh, bolder to face the uh, international player. So for SME, Malaysian SME being the backbone, I think it's time for for us to think think harder on what we can do to make our product of uh, a certain quality in terms of standards, and uh, that boils down to what I call innovation. Innovation is so important. I think it's time for us to, even like e-readiness, embrace what the uh, platform of digital. I think the COVID-19 has changed the whole thing. People start to think about, hey, my, my own way of doing things uh, cannot, cannot support me anymore. No? Then people just ask a question, but they never think to move forward. They keep on thinking, hey, after the COVID, uh, the, the vaccine is here, I think I'll go back to my normal way of doing things. So they suddenly forget about hey, this is not the end. This is not the the, the end of the what call once you have vaccine, you should think about how to prepare for the next level of competition, not just coming out from the digital, but also with this uh, asset coming into play. So mm -hmm. I, I I I I would urge you know the SME, uh, we have to be 
be bold la. I mean, we have to open up again. La. If not, uh, some some of them will be fully aged out, and there will be a, a, a long term implication on the industrial development of the country. So this much, I think, uh, I can I can comment at this juncture. But as what Dr. Sri say la, I mean, uh, hopefully from the government engagement, increase the awareness, all the e-commerce chapter, all the SME chapter, the focus are there. So they are really open up, you know, for your, you use the digital, the e-commerce. So I think we, we should grab this opportunity. La. Uh. Yeah, thanks a lot. Mr. Lee, I think uh, just now Dr. Sri mentioned as well, I think they will have a hand-holding program, uh, hold the SME in respect of awareness. Uh, just now, Datuk Sri asked the SMB to read the agreement. I don't think so. The SMB will read the agreement. I don't think they will read the agreement. <laughs> I think ah, what, okay. what, what a meeting should do and the SMB Corp and uh, together with Chamber, you know, whether yeah. ACCIM, Malay Chamber, Indian Chamber, or NCCIM, so we, we should conduct more engagement. Uh. I, I don't think anyone will read. Even I want to read also, I halfway also, I, I, I lost track. The committee will read the agreement and summarize for the SMB. Uh. Because SME need a su summary of the agreement. Okay, uh, I think uh, we, we come to these uh, questions from the participant. There's one Peter E asking about this question. Uh, with the recent rating downgrade, we know, uh, fish downgrade uh, for the BBP. And then uh, how would you think this would impact the competitiveness of Malaysia versus the uh, asset member? I think Wani Lim, uh, you can answer these questions from Peter E. Thank you, Mr. Kung again, and thank you, uh, Mr. Peter Yi. Uh, firstly, yes, I think that has been the issue of rating downgrade has made waves in cyberspace. And I just like to say that the thing about rating downgrades is that it's mainly looking at financial situation of a country. Can you repay your loan or not? Right? Are you juvie or are you subprime, basically? But the thing is, has indirect or very little impact on competitiveness because if you really want to stretch an argument, then Indonesia and Vietnam should be doing much better than us, right? Because nobody wants to buy their bonds, right? I mean, they are, they are even worse than us. And look, we lost, yes, we were downgraded, but in the two thousand mid-2000s, we regained it, right? So countries tend to, you know, get downgraded and get upgraded over time. It's just very normal. And, you know, we also have to consider the fact that, uh, let's look at Korea. I think normally people don't like to buy Korean bonds, lah, government bonds. I think, I think we also have to recognize the factor that it's just a very, very small consideration. So um, we don't have to worry too much about that. And the real issue that we should be looking at is productivity, right? I think that's more worrying because Malaysians we work really long hours, you know, we are all here. This is about nine something. We are all here, right? We are still working. But the thing is our productivity is, is rather low, you know, our yield is not that nice. And, you know, the other thing is, you know, brain drain, right? With RCEP, you know, one of the questions that will be asked will be brain drain. And brain drain doesn't just happen across countries. It's within country, right? So, you know, that's something that we really have to think about with RCEP or without RCEP. And, you know, aging, you know, a lot of us won't be here, you know, come in the next 10 years. So those are more fundamental questions that relate to competitiveness. So that's my take on it. Um, rating downgrade, yes, it's not great news, but I don't think it really affects our competition. So Thank it you. won't affect our competitions. Eh? So uh, we'll not that much. in that respect. Yeah. Okay, that's not very guys. good, Eddie. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's three, there's one question quite interesting. Uh, you're talking about uh, just now we're talking about hand holding program, and someone offer themselves to help you. Is it that's three? Any room for the active retirees, you know, <laughs> in any meaty business development work, especially with regard to asset? You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, uh, of my mind, I think perhaps, uh, I mean, of course, thank you very much for the question, and of course, to Mr. Patrick as well. Now, for those who are interested in, in helping this, in creating greater awareness or outreaching to the relevant stakeholders, we will welcome you, actually. In fact, uh, we are going to plan something like a training for trainers. Yeah, So we will rope in the relevant chambers of commerce uh, because we understand that as far as MITI is concerned, 
uh, we will be quite stretched in terms of our resources in trying to get this message across to as many people as possible within the shortest period of time. So therefore, we will need as many as, I would say, RSAP brand ambassadors out there to help us to actually get the message across. So we will welcome Mr. Patrick and other like-minded individuals to come forth to approach us and uh, we can work something out. Thank you. Yeah, it's good. Train the trainer. Lah. Let everybody train up, then they can train the SME in respect <laughs> how to go about it. You know? um, actually, just now I got one question I wanted to ask the panelists, but the participant, uh, Mr. Lai, uh, Luis Lai, asked a good question over here. He said, hi, sir. Will this uh, ASEP supersede the existing FTA? You know? For example, if they are dealing with the uh, China uh, will they only follow the AFTA, you know, the, <laughs> the, the free trade uh, agreements for, for the eight, um, they mean ASEAN, China, AFTA, all the asset, which one they should follow? I think who should answer this question? Uh, Mr. Lee? I think Dr. Sui should answer. Uh, <laughs> should answer. Because once Mr. Lee answer, that is uh, not a policy. When Dr. Sui answer, that that's a policy. <laughs> uh, correct, correct, correct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Mr. Lee, for giving me the opportunity um, again. Um, well, um, I think it all depends on the particular... So, for example, if you're looking from the perspective of exporting a particular product, yeah? So I think it's very important to first look through, say, if you're comparing, say, uh, RCEP with ATIGA, right? ASEAN Trade in Goods Agreement. Now, look through the particular HS code of your product and see as far as, and for example, yeah, okay, ATIGA only applies if you are exporting to another fellow ASEAN member country. But if it's RCEP, it's not only ASEAN member country or ASEAN member state, but you also have the other five ASEAN FTA partners. So first is to determine who are you exporting to. If it's just within the ASEAN member states, then I believe ATIGA will be a better choice, right? But if you say you're talking about, uh, from Malaysia, I plan to export to Japan, then you shouldn't be looking into ATIGA, you should be looking into the ASEAN plus Japan FTA. Then what you should be doing after that is to identify the particular HS code that corresponds to you, the product that you like to export and see under whether it's under RCEP or RCEP or under the ASEAN Japan FTA, which offers you a better preferential duty, right? Okay, then, no, I'm not finished yet, yeah? that is one part. Then you also have to follow up with the next uh, step, which is look at the particular rules of origin. Because you may, for example, say, for example, under RCEP, perhaps, or, or under ASEAN Japan, the duties might be lower than RCEP, but the rules of origin might be more stringent compared to RCEP. So you have to take this into consideration in determining whether to use the RCEP or vis-a-vis -vis another ASEAN plus FTA or even ATIGA itself. So if they do not know which one to use, they should come to Miti. Huh? <laughs> which one to use, you know, uh, in terms of uh, for the benefit of the Malaysian businessman. But those three, that's why the question is quite point. interesting. Mm. Okay, Mr. Lee, come. That's why the Miti must uh, have a contact point for them to refer to, to advise them, you know, to give them the information so that they know which are which are the free trade agreement that will benefit, optimize, you know, for, for the uh, uh, exporters. Yeah. So okay. Mitty should train the trainer, go and answer those questions. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Tato Sri, there's one question. It's quite interesting over here. They say in terms of the flow of the services, that means a natural person, a person mm -hmm. service mm -hmm. in this country A and country B. Mm -hmm. How will this work? For example, can Malaysia professionals like a lawyer, engineer, accountant, doctor, mm -hmm. an expert move in and out of asset countries easily you know, in, uh, for short-term work. That means they do not need the work permit or visa. So mm -hmm. how is it? Uh, okay, I think as far as uh, what we call, okay, in, in technical terms, it's called movement of natural persons. So as far as the services sector is concerned, when we talk about market access, they achieve four different levels of liberalization levels, yeah? And movement of natural persons is the highest level of liberalization. And this is also the most challenging part when we negotiate any FTA or in this particular instance, the RCEP amongst the 15 countries. Um, of course, at that time when India, when India was around, uh, with, uh, including with India. Um, but as far as movement of professionals are concerned, 
the RCEP does facilitate in a sense that it makes it transparent what are those laws applicable in that particular country in terms of regulating the entry of professionals um, into that country. But um, there's also the fact that each country is allowed, of course, to have their own domestic laws or regulations to regulate these entries. So although we say that, yes, you may have the freedom to move from one country to another within the RCEP region in terms of movement of professionals, but we also have to bear in mind that this is still subject to the domestic laws and regulations of those countries. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, there's one question. Uh, I think uh, when we discuss, we do touch up a little bit. When will the asset come into effect? Which year? I think, uh, Mr. Lee, uh, can you answer this question? No, I think that depends on the conditions that you need uh, nine members to ratify, right? If I'm not wrong, uh, six from ASEAN country and three from non ASEAN uh, members. Then only you can start, kickstart the whole thing. So, uh, most likely, I think within one year, hopefully, uh, not more than two years, uh, we hope to see this uh, smooth flowing of the uh, asset implementation. So maybe Dr. Sri can add on to this. No, yes, you're right, Mr. Lee. Uh, that's exactly the number that we're looking for, the magic number. Mm. So as long as there are six ASEAN member states mm. and three ASEAN FTA partners um, that have completed the domestic ratification process, and deposit their respective instrument of ratification with the ASEAN Secretariat. Uh, therefore, after then, the RCEP will come into force. Yeah, there is, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Sri, you got a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's one question is quite interesting. He said, Dr. Sri, what is the Malaysia strategy on RCEP and CPTTP as Vietnam uh, has overtaken and surpassed, uh, surpassing Malaysia? You know? under the World Bank ranking. I don't know if you talk about which ranking. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, to help government say to help the SME, but how and who? Uh, so on the ground, the local SME is not feeling the support given. Uh, this, uh, I think only one person can answer that is a Tato Sri from Miti. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh... I don't know. I, I, I can't, ca I mean, I didn't exactly quite catch the first part of the, of the question because I thought the that... The question was... is, uh, what is the Malaysia strategy on the ASEP and the CPTTP? As oh. Vietnam has overtaken Malaysia under the World Bank ranking. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I think as far as this, uh, of course, we know that we have signed the RCP or ASEP. Yeah? So, of course, the lingering question, I think, uh, amongst many of us is, when would we actually ratify the CPTPP? Because we have actually signed the CPTPP, but we have yet to ratify the CPTPP. And our government, of course, the cabinet has actually um, mentioned a uh, countless number of times that, of course, uh, we plan to ratify the CPTPP, mm -hmm. but there's no specific timeline or deadline set as yet in terms of how or when we, we actually plan to ratify the CPTPP. Now, this is because, um, each FTA has to be looked into it, has to be looked at in terms of its individual features, yeah, in terms of uh, the impact, uh, not only in terms to the businesses, but also to the policies of the country that is going to be a party to it. So similarly, with regards to CPTPP, uh, of course, METI that is being tasked by the government to coordinate uh, in terms of participation or negotiations of any FTA is undertaking that particular assessment exercise. And I, I believe uh, once that assessment, assessment exercise is completed and the results or the outcome of it is stable to the, to the cabinet, then I believe the cabinet will come, come to a decision as to when we can actually ratify the CPTPP. Uh, the second part of the question I think believes in, I believe is got to do with what the government actually um, is helping or is currently doing in helping the SMEs. Uh, I think by and large, if you look at the economic stimulus packages that we have introduced, um, ever since the government introduced the movement control order in March, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I would say that there are assistance or in terms of stimulus uh, packages, uh, they're actually dedicated to SMEs itself. Yeah, that's number one. But number two, I think mm -hmm. this is so very important. Yeah, um, there was a famous person that says um, that has this quote. Yeah, don't ask what the government can do for you, but what you can do for the country. 
all right? So in this instance, I think it's also fairly important for SMEs, number one, to have a regional mindset. That means don't only look at a local market, but try to become a regional and subsequently a global champion. Now, this is where I, again, uh, encourage our SMEs to actually to, again, you have to learn and you have to try to understand all those various uh, incentives that are being made available by the government, not only in terms of fiscal, but particularly in terms of the non-fiscal um, so-called uh, programs as well, particularly when it comes to upskilling and reskilling. Because you see, the FTA, for that matter, even RCEP, it only opens the door for you. But most importantly is how you plan to take advantage of it. Now, we always say that the FTA provides market access in terms of tariffs reduction, as well as, of course, easing on the North tariff barriers. But as we all know, um, there are a lot of things or factors that actually goes into, um, uh, I mean, to the decision that would help to, to market a particular product. So in terms of the quality of the product, the price, your after-sales service, and functionality. And in terms of, the, for example, even the technical features associated with the product. So what I'm saying here is, apart from looking at in terms of the FDA, there are certain other things as well that the SMEs themselves have to undertake to upgrade themselves uh, in order for them to be more competitive. Yeah, thank you, Datu Sri. There's a question talking about how uh, MITI uh, can assist uh, the uh, businesses. I think I'll uh, have a hand-holding program. Uh, yes. i answer for you this one. <laughs> there's one There's one question for Guan Ni uh, from Chin Tech Guan. Uh, it says 40% of the Malaysia export uh, rely on the ENE. Recently, we see a shift in the factories moving uh, to another ASEAN countries. You know. Will ASEAN cause a bigger disadvantage to Malaysia as it moves Malaysia towards a twin deficit? How can Malaysia position uh, itself and grow uh, and to, that means grow the other sector? Kwani, would you like to answer this question in respect of e and &E? I do, Mr. Kong. Thank you again. Um, look, yes, we rely a lot on e and &E and Kalapa uh, Sawit. And yes, uh, we see some factories shifting to other ASEAN countries. Uh, Vietnam, you know, people like to mention Vietnam. <laughs> Usually it's Vietnam anyway. But this thing has been going on for a very long time. I mean, let's not forget that we also take it from Singapore, right? You know, Penang, the Lim Chong Yu era, basically was following the strategy set by Singapore. And those days, people didn't go to Vietnam yet. The time still worrying, right? <laughs> so what happened was, it meant, went to Bangkok metropolitan area, and that's how they built their industry. And then there's China, right? So a lot of it rerouted to China. Then you have CLMV economies. So this thing is not recent. This thing has been going on for some time. And I don't, I don't get the twin deficit here, but I think for Malaysia, yes, we, we're not that skilled. Huh? We, we know that we are not Korea level. Yes, we, we all have to admit that, right? We are not Korea level, we are not Taiwan level, but over time, we've built up this um, ecosystem that Mr. Lee alluded to just now, that this is a supply chain and it's dictated by TNCs, right? Western D, Fairchild, so on and so forth. And if we want to talk about electronics, right, uh, there are many ways of seeing it because I think we all know that uh, the US is doing some trade restriction on China, right? I think that's been out in the open for some time. And I think most people probably don't know that we actually have a trade surplus with China when it comes to certain semiconductor products. And we, we, we actually have that, although the final goods, we may not compete with China, right? There's no way you can compete with making TVs with the Chinese, right? It's suicidal if you do that. But for certain sub-components, we have forged a very complementary relationship with China and other countries. And that's where, you know, you, you lose some, yes, but you also win some. And if you look at Penang, right, I think in terms of assembly and testing, I think we're quite good, right? Globetronics, whatnot, right? We're, we're pretty good. It's just how do we move upstream or downstream to higher value add activities? I think that's the thing that really keeps, you know, people like me tee up awake at night because it's very, very difficult. It's very, very difficult, and we've been trying to do it for a very long time. I think that's the bigger question 
is that we, we are a trading nation. We've always done this since Portuguese Malacca time. Is that we are very good at creating this complementary effect with the rest of the world. So that's that's the thing that we are concerned here. Lah. So thank you for this. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kwani. I think uh, last questions, I think I, I select for Mr. Lee better to answer. Otherwise, Mr. Lee is too quiet over there. You know? <laughs> uh, there's one. How ASEP will spur more FDI expansion in Malaysia instead of uh, uh, all the FDI go to another other ASEAN countries? You know? How ASEP will spur more FDI? You know? Obviously, if you look at ASEP, it's talking about facilitate uh, greater flows of investment and trade. So investment side, which I mentioned early on, ASEP will complement ASEAN as a, a hub. You know, either it's a production hub or a, a hub for investment or for economic activity. So Malaysia being strategically located, so we have this advantage of the market access position, uh, competitive advantage. Of course, we, we, we still have to face competition from the rest of the ASEAN member. But first thing, we have to look into our home. What are the things that we can offer, which other people can offer? Now, in terms of the tax rate, we are not that competitive. Corporate tax rate is 24%, compared to other countries, about 17 in Singapore, 20% in Vietnam. Uh, even Indonesia uh, coming to uh, 22 this year, next year will be 20. So that is one aspect. But the other thing that we, I always tell government that we have to look into beyond the tax structure, beyond what we call natural resources uh, supply. That is what we call stability in the economic policy, uh, predictability of your uh, ways of doing business, uh, accountability. And based on the World Bank study, when they survey 2,400 uh, CEO of the, in the emerging market, you know what they rank? They said what matters most for investment in any country is about economy and political stability and also a very transparent, predictable regulatory environment. So recently I've done the study about all these government regulator and business relationship. So these are at the federal level, at the local government level, and also at the state level. We are talking about regulatory reform. There's a lot of problems. They have been uh, uh, feedback to us. And at the level which they feel that, the government has not given much emphasis on some of the domestic direct investment versus FDI. Malaysia definitely welcome FDI, but at the same time, we also want to promote domestic uh, direct investment. I think ASEP will put us even more pressure for us to enhance our investment climate. Uh, those that I, I outlined, but most importantly, you must give them the supply of what they call the skill manpower. You can attract whatever high-tech industry to the country, but if you cannot address the shortage of skill manpower, I think FDI, will, the investor will still find elsewhere. And, and when it comes to decision-making, give them very transparent information for them to decide. Uh, where to put the money in. Yeah? So I think I, I totally agree that there are a lot of sectors that Malaysia can promote, but I think we have to address the underlying, the structural weakness that we have, skill, manpower, and also the in terms of the regulatory side. I think there's room for us to further make it more uh, uh, friendly and facilitate, not just to the foreign direct investment, but also within the domestic uh, investor. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kong. Okay, your voice is well heard, loud and clear to our Miti, uh, Tattoo 3 over here. Yeah. Ah. Okay, we need to, uh, a lot of questions being asked. I say a lot of questions, so we are not able to answer live, you know. Uh, so I think uh, we need to wrap up these sessions after one hour plus. Uh, uh, I think three panelists, uh, you have a wonderful um, answer and then the uh, all the uh, questions, some of the questions, uh, you answer some of the questions we can't answer over here. Uh, last but not least, what advice would you like to give to the uh, audience over here? You know? uh, especially um, some key takeaway message. You know? Why not we start from uh, Dato Sri over here? You mute, you mute, unmute, unmute your speaker. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Kong. Um, I think from, from Miti's perspective is, uh, once again, we would like to encourage our business sector, especially the SMEs, uh, to participate in the upcoming outreach sessions that we'll be organizing very much soon. In fact, as soon as next week, we will be having a webinar with, organized by the Federation of Nation Manufacturers, um, where we'll also be providing a keynote address plus a presentation on our set. Now, apart from that, of course, uh, just because we have concluded our negotiations and of course, with the signing of our RCEP, the, as far as the government is concerned, the work does not stop there. Now it's about helping our businesses, the SMEs, to actually avail themselves of the opportunities presented by the RCEP. And uh, not only in terms of what's in the RCEP, but most importantly, in helping them to upgrade through either upskilling or rescaling of the human capital, as well as through technological upgrade by availing themselves of the various programs that we have, particularly with regards to Industry 4.0. Thank you. Thank you, Datuk Sri. Um, Lee, so I need to go away. Your mute, you have muted your speaker as well. I think, okay, I hope, I hope the India will eventually join the ASEP big family. Then we have a bigger uh, markets to go. And I also hope that the uh, ASEP will be smoothly implemented so that we can optimize the effect, the positive effect uh, from the ASEP. And lastly, I would... Uh, advise the SME company in Malaysia, uh, continue to beef up your competitive advantage through innovation and embrace the technological uh, development. That is the key. Uh, and, and, and we must realize that the post-pandemic had uh, heightened the need for business in terms to re reconsider their uh, supply chain. And people are talking about reshoring, nearshoring, rebasing manufacturing. I think that's the time for us to capitalize as uh, ASEP will, will enhance uh, all the members in the regional supply chain. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Guani, your, your mic muted. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kong. And yeah. you know, very, short, very short and sweet and echoing the two panelists is that, uh, look, RCEP, it's an accelerator. It's not a game changer. To me, it is an accelerator, not a game changer. And you win some, you lose some. You know, we cannot win all, not realistic. So for us, you know, the question that we have to answer is, can we get rich before we get old? Again, you know, the question is aging. Aging, you know, we, we always don't discuss it. And the other one is, you know, raising productivity and raising innovation. I think that's the, you know, key message that I'm trying to push out. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, panelists, for your sharing, uh, wonderful sharing and insight in these sessions. And thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us and participating in this uh, wonderful topic, ASAP. Uh, we hope you gain some knowledge and valuable takeaway, and then uh, all the answer to your questions which are relevant to you. Uh, that's all. I think that's all that's time for tonight. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will hand over to our host, Victor. Thank you for having me as well as the moderator of your sessions. Okay, Victor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kong, for moderating you, such Kong. an interesting discussion. And also thank you to our three expert panelists, Dato Sri Norasman Ayob, Mr. Lee Hingui, and Mr. Guani Lim. I'm sure that our audience has a better understanding of RCEP now. So before we end, please help us complete the evaluation form, which will appear on your screen now. Once again, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We hope that uh, you have gained valuable insights on RCEP. If you'd like to know more about RCEP, join us for the Export Excellence Awards webinar on 15th December at 8 p.m. as there will be a discussion on this topic as well. You can register at bit.ly slash EEA webinar one. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank, thank you everyone. You. Thank you, right. Good night. Thank you.